Thank you very much, Rudy, and thanks to the I2B2 Transmart and Transmart Foundation uh, to invite me to present this um, uh, keynote, where this um, is a great honor to uh, to present during the this meeting, and the and a lot of things have been happening, and a, and a lot of things have been happening since yesterday. So what happened is I completely changed my presentation. Completely. So I haven't rehearsed, of course, otherwise there's no fun. And the, the idea here is to explain uh, a journey, ju the journey of since I attended the first AUG meeting uh, seven years ago, the only thing that has been stable in my life for the past seven years was every year to come in June to the I2B2 user group meeting. I only met my wife five years ago. So the, the thing is, every single year I've come here, I've come here, and seven years ago, I tried to have discussion with Zach about postdoc, difficult. Then six years ago, I tried again to have a postdoc uh, here. And he told me, great, what would you like to do? I said, well, there's a Transmart that came out. Maybe we could have Transmart and I2B2 working together. He said, great, write me two pages. And for when? For tomorrow. So I didn't sleep, sleep that night. I was at the hotel over there and then wrote during two at the night, two pages around this. And then um, the next day he said, yeah, great. But uh, there was a question he would find some funding, then he didn't find the funding, and then the question, and then I, I started the postdoc four years ago in his team um, and uh, to, uh, in order to, to start uh, all this. And so, the, the, so that's why it's a great honor today to, to be able to, pr to present the work that we've been doing. And, and you, as you'll see, I won't show today a live demo. No live demos, I've, uh, I've shown many. And here it's more the question of getting the history of what is the history of, in my point of view, of I2B2 and what's the history of Transmart and having the both that at the beginning were together and then separated. And then now we're trying to put them together. So first, in the context of I2B2, where I started to learn about I2B2 when I arrived at the Pompidou Hospital in Paris, where this hospital was created in July 2000 from the closing of three old hospitals into one brand new hospital, where with a new EHR information system, and that's why my former boss, Professor Patrice de Goulet, managed to get the HIMSS level of compliance level six, stage six. Where well, this is a huge, a real big deal. And what does it mean? It means that a EHR, electronic health record, has is intelligent enough to be able to have additional function than just deliver uh, the information. It's really about, for example, in order to get the level six, physician documentation, structured template, full CDSS, variant and compliance, closed loop medication and administration, to make sure that it's a full, uh, implemented uh, EHR within the information system. And so, for example, for level five, you need to have a full radiological pack, so meaning to have all the images integrated. And one of the elements, so he managed to get level six, he was the first university hospital in Europe to get level six. And what was missing for level seven is a data warehouse. So that's why he told me, go and look at I2B2. So I2B2, that was created based on RPDR, which was created by many years ago. And that's where Dyne helped uh, uh, this at the beginning. It's really, what, 20 years ago, maybe? And in order to have an... In no, RPDR. Of creating an internal system at Partners Healthcare that was proprietary and that wasn't open source to be able to integrate all the data from the hospital and make it available. And then Sean, Zach, and Suzanne together wrote the I2B2 proposal mm -hmm. in order to, be, to get funded to have parts of RPDR 
not all of it, that were open source and made available to the community. So that uh, was a huge project, eight years of funding from the NH, and with the great help of Helen, who really helped this all around the way as a program officer, to be able to create a sustainable platform that was used uh, um, around the world to be able to integrate all those different layers of information. So then, uh, and when you said Paul's vision to bring all those layers of information, I didn't have this vision. They had. It's them who said to be able to bring, creating all those layers of information was in the vision of the I2B2 model to be able to have this. And so to be very clear, the, as an example, because it's really about creating baseline phenotype from any kind of data, but also when you're going to tell me the, the genotype, there wasn't, the, people will say, and it's brand new, that they, you couldn't do put genotype data within I2B2. And the, one of the reason is the fact that it's really, because at the beginning, Zach really wanted to focus on the complex phenotypic data. Because as he wrote, and in 2002, so Zach wrote this book, 2002 MIT Press, in microarray for an integrative genomics. So when people are saying, well, they didn't think of integrating genomic data in I2B2, well, he wrote a book about it, about genomic data within 2002. So why wasn't there genomic data in I2B2 at the time? It's because he said the most expensive element, and this is written in many articles, is to get the phenotypic data right, to be able to have the complex heterogeneity of all the phenotypic data, the longitudinal, the heterogeneous data, to be able to have it right so that we could do correlation with the genomic data afterwards. But first, because no one was doing this at the time, so that's why I2B2 was uh, taken out of, of the ground. And so that's why in 2010, then in production in more than 120 university hospitals around the world, and maybe the most important element of I2B2, which is not well known from everyone, is this page. Why I2B2 was successful, it's not about the technology. It's about making biomedical discoveries. It's about being able to help and do fact science and publish in journals outside the scope of biomedical informatics. It's to make sure that things can be discovered, that the IT can help research. This page, if you haven't had a look at this page, maybe it's the most important page I have in my whole presentation. The driving biology projects in I2B2 was the, and is still the huge success of I2B2 in making sure and doing collaboration with disease experts using the technology as a driving example to use all this data, all this technology to make impact. And that's how there's more than 500 publications in those driving biology projects from I2B2 where it's not about the technology, it's really about making real discoveries. And that's where it makes this huge impact. And so when from I was European in Paris, my boss told me, look at this I2B2, start to look at working with um, uh, Eric Zaplotal, an engineer, uh, in, in order to put all the data from the EHR in the Oracle database Nine, uh, 945 tables into the I2B2 uh, model, version 1.2 at the time, where there's five tables, now there's six, and then to work of making sure to do all the ETL process to integrate all the different kinds of data. Because it's a IMS level six, we even have the drug prescription and the validation of the drug prescription by the pharmacist as an I2B2 data type. The power of I2B2 is you can integrate any kind of patient level data within your system so that you can integrate it and do any kind of studies. The most difficult part of this wasn't the ETL process, wasn't the installation, wasn't to convince the equivalent of EPIC in France called, um, uh, um, uh, oh, what's your name? Uh, oh, I forgot. <coughs> 
uh, uh, Dexcare. Dexcare, they couldn't have to convince them that we, we needed a real-time copy of the full production database in order to do the full ETL process. That wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part was to be able to get the authorizations, to be able to, for the first, this was the first clinical data warehouse where the data was collected prior hypothesis, prior any study, specific study that we wanted to do. So to get the authorization at the national level for the equivalent of HIPAA, for the equivalent of the uh, IAB level, and we had to create an IAB within the hospital for this, and to convince all the healthcare, the, the, the directors, the head of the departments. So I met with every single one of them for two hours, creating them their first account so they could see it. Their first reaction is, oh, people can see my data. Well, no, it's not your data. It's by law the patient's data in France. And so, uh, and, but straight, straight away, because the department heads are very smart, they realize, oh, I can see the other's data. And so that's how they agree. So it's really to be, because it was to get the consortium. And one of the biggest success of Shrine, Shrine, when you had multiple I2B2 uh, instances and to be able to do queries across the different hospital, is not on the technology part, is not on creating the ontology mapping between all this, is what Suzanne and others managed to get is the authorization to do it, to be able to be the first one to create this to have the Harvard Hospital agreeing to collaborate so that there could be queries across them. And so it's more of, and it's a, it's a human, as you all know, because you, the, the fact that you're here is you're interested in all this technology and you are all facing every single day the issue of how to be able to put things together. And then, so what we uh, started to do is to integrate all those different data. And then I saw a paper from Eric Peraklis on Transmart and also with Dan Arsman from Recombinant, who's in the room right now. I didn't know he was in the room. And so what they did at the time is Recombinant, the company with Johnson & Johnson, we, so Johnson & Johnson hired Recombinant, where they took the I2B2 open source software and that's a very important distinction in my talk about the I2B2 software and the I2B2 database model. So they took both. They took I2B2 software and database, and then they added analytical capabilities on top of it to be able to answer, to go a step further than what I2B2 was doing at the time was having patient counts. It was to be able to generate summary statistics, to be able to generate hypothesis to be able to also to start putting genomic data, gene expression data, SNP arrays, in order to have and starting to build all those different layers of information. One of the downsides of it is that they limited the scope for clinical trials because that's what they needed. So the fact that they didn't had access to EHR longitudinal data, so there were some design scope to limit to four clinical trials. So they took I2B2 database, I2B2 software, both of them, and then applied it in the context of clinical trials to be able to well represent all this information for an internal product. And then when I saw the paper, I contacted Johnson & Johnson and say, hey, within our hospital in Paris, we would love to test it. It took, I and I, so six months with the Johnson & Johnson lawyers to try to have an early version of the Transmart tool, which didn't see. And I remember this date when Transmart became open source, January 24th, 2012. Why? Because I had a master student working in creating, a, a, integrating data within Transmart, but we didn't have the tool. He started November 1st, 2011. We didn't have access to the tool. So he started to freak out and say, are you sure this is a good idea? I say, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. With the lawyers, we're going to get... So with the lawyers, it didn't work. Why? Because the lawyers were asking that they could access all our data. So from the hospital point of view, this couldn't work. So then, since and so the discussion stopped, January 24th, we were got access to be able to download the first version, open source of Transmart, which was the version 0 
very, 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 very difficult to install. It took us four months just to install it. And to, why are you laughing? <laughs> why? Because they took the internal version of Transmart, the Johnson & Johnson, which was great, and then they took part of it, but not all of it, into the open source release. So then they were glitched, there were things missing, lots of back and forth, great support in order to help to, to make this happen. And so then that's where, finally, when we managed to have a first version stable working with I2B2 and full I2B2 database and software was the version 1.0 underscore hotfix, hotfix because there was the security across the different clouds that were working. So in the code branch, version 1.0 hotfix, that's the first one we managed to fully install, managed to integrate all those different data, and managed to do something that we were really interested in the context what we were seeing in this I2B2 world, where you could have all your data, and within I2B2, there was the link with Shrine and, uh, and Smart and project led by Ken Mendel, to be able to have patient-level data lookup within an EHR system, Shrine to be able to make connections, and, and, th and this is led uh, Shrine by Doug McFadden, to the, he presented two days ago, of having multiple I2B2 instances. So to be able to have, and that's what we really wanted, the link with Transmart, to be able to do advanced statistical tools, Biobank, Variant Explorer, to be able to have this overall system. And so we started to integrate our first study, only 130 patients from replicating a study of uh, published in Journal of Clinical Oncology on uh, cancer patients to be able to reproduce within Transmart the survival curve from the study of getting the first. And so the master's student uh, succeed, he did it, he majored the, uh, his promotion, so everything worked, worked fine. So we have an in, we had this first version of Transmart, and then Transmart got a huge funding with the Atrix project, and that's why they released the version 1.1. And they did something wrong. In version 1.1, because of various issues, they had to take I2B2 away. So, to be very clear, I2B2, they left the database model, of I2B2, the same tables, but they took the software. Everything that Sean showed you, they took it away in version Transmart 1.1. So that's why when I saw this, I started to scream, hey, we don't want that. I want all the power of I2B2 software with all the functionalities and all the development, all the community, all the plugins, everything working with the database, but and so that's, that, that was a, a big issue. And so that's why when I arrived as, and when I asked, so six years ago, when I asked Sean, uh, uh, Zach if I could do a postdoc, he said, yeah. And I, the, the exact po the postdoc was using Transmart and I2B2 together to have the across trial functionality working again with both of them work uh, with I2B2 and Transmart. And then, um, what, what, when I arrived as a postdoc four years ago, and to be very clear, that's where Country Library, Harvard Medical School, and so I used Google Maps and Greg's List to find the closest place for my work. So I only had four minutes to commute to, be, to make sure that I was only focusing on making this happen. And so what, what Zach asked me at the time when he saw when I showed him a live demo of the version we had of Transmart running with I2B2, he said, how did you manage to make this happen? He said, well, we work, we work the, it's, now Transmart is open source and all that, we managed that, okay, that's great. Could you integrate all those different data sets I have on autism? He said, yeah, great, fine. And so, worked a lot. And uh, at the time, I was alone uh, as a postdoc and then started to install the servers, install the, the I2B2, Transmart, the so database, the Oracle, um, integrate all the data. And so asking me to integrate for 16,000 individuals, all the EHR data, the research, co multiple research cohort, like the Simon Simplex collection, the one I showed you two days ago, with all the clinical variables and 
the biobank data, the patient consent, gene expression data. So in one minute, uh, Zach asked me to integrate everything within IHB3 Transmart, and then he told me, have fun. So that was my postdoc project when I arrived. And so I said, okay, where do I install it? So I had to find servers at Boston Children's Hospital and John Bickle helped me a lot to get started. And because I was living so close, then what happened is within six weeks of doing only this, my uh, um, uh, fiance at the time was still in Paris, no kids, so working full time, full time every day, within six weeks, I was able to uh, have to do 80% of the work of doing the full installation and integrating all this data. So then that's where he told me, quit your job in Paris and let's talk about a faculty position at Harvard. I said, great. So that's why everything came because of Transmart and being, being able to integrate and being able to do it myself by getting my hands dirty and getting started. So the, then the deal was, uh, you would have two years of your funding, but if you want to be able to, um, uh, to, to stay, you need to find your funding after two years and to start uh, finding uh, le, and to build your team. So the, uh, then I, with outstanding collaborators here, because it's an outstanding uh, uh, community, so I was able to find first funding to be able to stand to hire. My first hire was Michael McDuffie. I don't know if he's here today but uh, extremely useful in order to get started and finish all the crappy code that I wrote in order to put the things together and say, okay, now you stop coding and um, you go and find the money. So then we, uh, within the uh, three years uh, of getting and creating and getting funding with our, uh, outstanding collaborators and opportunities, that's where all the things I'll be showing you from now was created not just by the two of us, but by our team, by our team with the uh, postdocs, by the software developers. And so this was, wouldn't be, have been possible, what I'll be, you know, now what I'm going to show you, without their help, because it's really a, a, um, a community effort. So who we don't have QAs. The QAs are the postdocs, and they hate that <laughs> because <laughs> because we ask them to so the so we are building we have the internal release and all that and the key point i want to make is everything i'll be showing you the only one who committed code from what we've built are those guys the only reviewers were them then we have four uh projects live today in production accessible from the outside world and so that's why we got additional uh, correction and all that. But we were not sharing a code. A lot of people ask me, how can I use your version? I say, yeah, it's complex. Uh, so we want to change this today, definitely. Because having only this list of people contributing to this code is not enough. That's not going to work. That's not going to be sustainable. And so that's where I think there's a, 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 an outstanding opportunity now to open it, to create something truly open source, so to be able to have something into at a, a much bigger dimension. So the infrastructure, and I'll come back to that later, but the infrastructure that we have today is to have I2B2, but I2B2, the real I2B2, meaning the database without changes, and the software. So when I hear that there's integration with I2B2 and Transmart, have to be careful because there's not always the software. Otherwise, it's taking away all the work and 15 years of work from Sean of creating this I2B2 software layer. And I profoundly think we shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel. We should use this. It's really to use the real I2B2, the li latest version that is fully compatible with all the version you have already installed. So the software and the database and the, on, the underlying data. 
to use Transmart as an application, one of the application layer on top, on top of it, to be able to boost the data. The RESTful API to have a scalable population-wide API that I showed you two days ago, that enables to access all this data, but then to have also additional bricks within the system, like many people are doing, but you use Jupyter Notebooks to be able to do the full study. Will you be able to run a full analysis in the UI of Transmart or I2B2 or I2B2 Transmart? I doubt it. There's only one paper that Zach managed to do with Shrine, plus uh, published in Plus One, where he managed to publish using only the UI of Shrine to be able to see the co-occurrence of autism comorbidities. That's, I think, the only paper, research, I'm talking about research, making biomedical findings, from using just the UI. The UI is meant to generate hypotheses, to have a first sense of the data, to touch it, to know if you want to go into a much bigger desk within the, within the, the data, and then to write a full IAB to have access to the full data. And then, but so the UI is great. There's no question about this, but then you needed something else and not just a direct, because how am I, am I postdoc working before was to have a direct access to the Oracle database to be able to use all this data. But then this is not scalable. You can't make an Oracle the connection. So it's really about having an API and having, in order to do reproductible science, to have those notebooks, as Ward showed you a demo and how I showed you two, um, two days ago, of having all these different steps to be able to do real reproductible science so someone else can use it. And then to use CTEX as a natural language processing tool to be able to reuse all the knowledge buried within the clinical notes. Genome, an outstanding variant store developed by sec one at Boston Children's Hospital. And we made the link with I2B2 Transmart so that you can make queries and see the detail of all the different variants within uh, this ecosystem. Then also to store within SciDB, uh, as, um, uh, 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 also a variant store, column-based, uh, created by Stan Breaker, who created Postgres, where you can run the computational in the database, where you have log, uh, algebra in the database, and you can call it through our API, so that you can, and we're working with close collaboration with their team, to be able to have something truly scalable. And today we have 8,600 full annotated exomes from the Simon Simplex collection in SciDB. And then to, and one of the key points for all of this is security, is to make sure that we are, we can be trusted. Our, the, the projects I'll be showing you are on the web. They're not behind a firewall. So we need to make sure that the level of security of the whole infrastructure met standards. And so what we did is to make sure to get HIP, the HIPAA compliance, even if in all those projects, we don't have HIPAA data. The HIPAA compliance means that you have a high level of security of the overall infrastructure. And so what we did is to manage to get the level four, where at the Harvard IAB security levels, where level five, there's only one study in the whole history of Harvard University. Harvard University from 1600, there's only one study. This level five study is about, it's not done by us, it's done at the other side of the Charles River, of illegal immigrants within the United States. And so if there's a security breach, those individuals could go to jail. So it's not just to protect the guy. So it's really extremely sensitive data. So this computer, I saw the PI and he explained me what he had, what she had to do. There's one computer, very expensive computer with a complete air gap, no connection whatsoever in a room which is a, a, a Faraday cage with two locks and two keys to be able to get in the, in the room. That's level five. No connection, no USB, no internet whatsoever. And, but we wanted to go on Amazon and on the cloud and to go with PHI, with identifiable information, PHI, even because the definition of HIPAA is uh, Harvard University is not 
a, 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 a HIPAA a, 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 doesn't have to, by law, comply to the HIPAA rules because we it's not an institution producing the data. We're only receiving it from other institutions. And so that's why the hospitals must meet the HIPAA compliance, but at Harvard, we don't have to. But what we did is to, as if we had to, even if on all the projects, and it's only a project with Ken Mandel at Boston Children's Hospital, where we, by law, have to meet this level of HIPAA compliance, but we, we wanted across all our projects to have the same uh, development of tools that meet this level of compliance. And we managed to get this level four of to be able to host very sensitive information on Amazon. So is this publicly available? No. Do we want to change this today? Yes. Why? Because we need to have a, a, a real broad community and helping us in order to be truly open source and to, to be able to scale. And so in order to get the HIPAA compliance, one of the key point is the authentication and to make sure that we don't store we don't transit we never see the password of an individual never we technically we don't see the password and so there's many different tools that enable this and one uh, od zero is a great provider that enables to make the connection between all the different enterprise identity providers and which is also o2 uh, compatible to be able to use across the different tools we had, so I2B2 transfer, the API, the Jupyter Notebooks, to be able to have, a so that we never see a password, we don't transit through them. So, and then to have the different level of access control between, and this change per study, because it depends on, at the end of the day, what did the patient sign, what is the consent? So we needed to have the infrastructure that could fit within this model. And then as I showed you, and I, I won't do a live demo again, but to show you how within the API, we were able to make the connection between longitudinal data, a full annotated exome, and the exact exome aggregation consortium database, such and into a protected environment. And that's where you can have access to the API and to be able to play with it. So uh, one of the, also the key element for the HIPAA compliance is the fact that to be able to be audited on how we install everything. So one of the key points is to be able to, yes, the code source is on GitHub of the application, but they, they should also be on the infrastructure so that to have the infrastructure as code, meaning that how you install it is also in GitHub using deployment script. And so we use Ansible right now to be able to do the various deployments so that it's automatic, so that we don't have to do things by hand. We don't change the elements by hand. So that this has been audited, the script by the security officers to be able to make sure that we know what is open, what is what the ports open, what the ports are closed and all that. And so, and then to have all the secrets in a deployment of an I2B2 Transmart, today we have, I think, 45 different passwords, different passwords per stack, per installation. Why? There's the Oracle root password, then the all the different schema in Oracles, all the different users, and all those are passwords. You never put passwords in GitHub. Where do you put them? Where are they generated? Where do you store them? So you need to have a vault system, uh, a, a password management system. And we use the uh, Itachi system called uh, Vault that enables to store all our different passwords. And so then, because, as I'll show you, we're moving everything to Docker, we had a big problem of how to access this to avoid the man in the middle attack of making sure that uh, we could trust the dockerization of the, with the protection of all the secrets. And then also to be able, and that's uh, 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 an amazing work uh, that is done by the, the database team uh, within my team, is to have the installation of the database also to be audited and everything to be in version control. So to have the application in GitHub, the infrastructure in GitHub, but also in the way the structure of the database is. So we use LiquidBase to be able to have the same source code 
of our database infrastructure, all the scripts within the database, which is also the same across all the various projects. So the data is, of course, different, but the infrastructure of the database is the same. So that's also a key element. So to have all the three elements in GitHub. Today, everything is shut down. Why? Because to contribute is very difficult. And so, because we're moving everything to Docker, we definitely need your help in order to scale up. And that's where, uh, that's the, the big change that we're making today is we really need the, the help of this community to make this happen. One of the also key elements for HIPAA compliance is to monitor everything. In, uh, in order, one of the first steps for HIPAA compliance is to sign a business associated agreement, a BAA, between a cloud vendor or an uh, any uh, third party and your institution. And I saw the BAA from Harvard and the one from Boston Children's Hospital. And what's outstanding is they're different. There's a common ground but there are vari variations and I'm not allowed because it's written, I'm not allowed to say what those differences are. But the thing is, it's a six page document describing the responsibility of both parties. What Amazon has to do related to the security in order to store PHI, meaning storing patient data, nominative data, and what we have to do. And it's Harvard lawyers who, uh, I wasn't involved in the creation in the, the in the negotiation of the BAA it was Harvard lawyers who did it it took 18 months to do of back and forth then when I saw it when it was signed and I read it I started to freak out I said that we, it's written that we meaning I as a PI and being in charge of the data I have to do all this so you know the first thing you want to do for the HIPAA compliance read your BAA, the one that your institution is signing, to see every task that you will have to do. And one of the big things is monitoring. The word monitoring is one of the BAA is written seven times. I have to do to monitor everything, what the users do, what the infrastructure does. And by default, Amazon doesn't do this monitoring. They do the monitoring of the infrastructure for 14 days. But by the BA, you need to monitor and to be able to store what happened after that. So then you need either to install open source tool that helps you to do all this monitoring, all this surveillance, or, and that's because I completely freaked out when I saw this, I said, okay, I'm trying to make economy on many things, but let's not make economy on this and let's have the professionals helping us in order to have the best teams I could find. So we tested 10 different tools, and at the end, that's the one we selected internally. Who cares what tools you use? At the, at the end, you just want to make sure, and there's a huge overlap between all of them. So I'm not making an, a, any advertisement for them or whatsoever. It's, but we, it's just a question of uh, making sure that all the scope of your infrastructure what the if you are, are on the attack if you uh, the, the proxy everything being monitored so you know exactly what's going on and then to create reports to receive them and then to, re to read them to create those alerts to know exactly what is going on and so that was a huge uh, element within this uh, to make sure that to to go and then what's great is those company are very interested in creating collaborations in order so you can get a huge uh, the deduction in their price, in their fees, to be able to, and having their help, to monitor and to do exactly what you need to do. So that's uh, one of the key points, because out of the box, Amazon won't do everything. They will do some elements, but not all of them. And so one also downside of Amazon, as it happened in end of February 2000 this year, half of the internet of the west coast went down for six hours why who noticed this who who was on the computer and realized there's something wrong so i sent emails to my team say hey our servers don't work and said yeah paul 
internet doesn't work. <laughs> so, ah, okay, sorry. So, it's funny how one man did one typo in a backup environment in Amazon in North Virginia, and this paralyzed half of the East Coast for six hours. Why? You could imagine there's redundancy and all that, but they were at a breaking point and there were, many things didn't restart in time. It, it, story, and there's all the redundancy and all that. But we have an issue of only trusting one cloud vendor, even if there's redundancy across the different sites. And the safest place on earth today to store a file is a S3 bucket with the redundancy across all the or uh, around the world but there's issue because there's men's involved and all that so we need to have a solution in order to make sure that we are scalable across different cloud vendors and so that's where we started a journey using docker and with everybody can start using and if you haven't yourself everyone in the room who has done the uh, the um, the Docker demo, which takes 20 minutes on docker.com website. So all the ones that are not raising your hand, you should do it. It's a very easy demo, 20 minutes to download and to start your VM and all that. Very, very easy to use, docker.com. Docker is going to change the IT world. It's outstanding, Docker or any microservices service. It's outstanding. Docker that just came out four years ago, and everybody's talking about it. Everybody's saying, yeah, we are Dockerizing our application and all that. But then, okay, let's say we want now to have our infrastructure on the Docker for production without losing our HIPAA compliance. That's another issue. Why? Because we want it to be across multiple cloud vendors, Amazon, Google, IBM, and Azure, and so that's why we got funded by the NIH Common Fund in order to have a cloud pilot between starting with Amazon and IBM. And it's very, very hard. Why? Because the, all those different cloud vendors are not at the same level of development of their security of their infrastructure. So the API for the formation, the automatic formation in IBM is definitely not at the same level as the one with uh, Amazon. So we have to do so many things by hand with uh, IBM, and so that's that's a big issue. So what we really want to create is private uh, uh, security private clouds between those different clouds using and using Docker Data Center, which is a product by Docker, very expensive, very, very expensive. And we are trying to see if we could use this in order to secure all our environment to make sure to have uh, the deployment across the different infrastructure. And so it's a, it's a journey, it's definitely not easy. One of the, the, the big, and we're working in close collaboration with the Docker team in order to say, okay, that's what we have, we want to move to production. And by the way, who is in production with real patient data today? No one, no one in the world has real PHI patient data in Docker. And so that way there's, there's an opportunity. This is definitely the future and we really want to, to make this happen. And so what we were, one of the elements we were really worried is the data. Where can we put, because you can put your Oracle or Postgres database in a Docker container, but then it could vanish in a second and everything could disappear. And so based on Docker recommendation, don't put a production database in a container, not in 2017. So that's where, based on their advice, we still have our database on Amazon, RDS, to have all the different backup and all that. But then to use, and we want our application, our 2 b 2 Transmart, to be able to be deployed across all those different cloud vendors the same way. One of, and that's a, a work that, done by Andre in my team, one of the big issues we have is the fact that in, in order to deploy the infrastructure, you have the image of the Docker, but we can't store any uh, secrets. 
So we need to have all the passwords stored within Vault, but how we make the link between our password manager and the dockerization. And this is today, in June 2017, an unsolved issue. To have something robust, to have in something extremely um, secure, and so Docker has a solution, a better version. We are trying right now another solution the, uh, that was created by Cloudflare called Red October. And the idea of Red October is to make sure that you can't have one individual having the keys to launch something. So it's to have at least two individuals at any time that are necessary and there can be multiple combinations to make sure to be able to unlock the data and unlock the key in order to protect the dockerization and the deployment. Because how to have the whole idea of Docker is to have automatic uh, deployment, but how do you handle those passwords into a really protected environment? So is this the way to go? We don't know, but that's the one we are trying. It's working and we are uh, and more than happy to uh, share all this with you in order to help us uh, to scale. Because the, um, uh, you know, because our key point is uh, deploying a Docker within your own laptop is easy. It takes five, five, five seconds, one minute to download it, five seconds to, to deploy, it's done. But then how to deploy the Docker, the container, where is the ship for a production environment? That's the very difficult part. And that's where uh, we need to have a lot of people helping us testing it and using it. And so one also of a huge project is the Green Project, the Genomic Research Innovation Network led by Ken Mendel. And it's across the three key leaders, pediatric hospital in US, Cincinnati, <coughs> Children's Hospital, uh, CHOP, uh, so CHOP, and uh, um, uh, 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 Cincinnati and Philadelphia, and uh, Boston Children's Hospital. So what we created is using our open source infrastructure, a green central access for investigators across the three different hospitals to be able to access all the various data within I2B2 Transmart, Genome, Jupyter Hub, Harvest, and other tools to be able to have one clouded research big data environment, HIPAA compliance across the various institutions. And so it was, at the end, more a management project than an IT project. And so the, and one of the key features we really wanted to do is to have is the link with the, a variant store that can be used directly from I2B to Transmart and to Genome that uh, created by Sequon at Boston Children's Hospital. And so that's where we can make phenotyp phenotypic to genotypic and genotypic to phenotypic within uh, uh, this environment. And then in the context of open data, what we created is, and I've already presented this, but so I'll go quickly and in, for the sake of time, multiple data sets that are available today. So when people are asking me, can I test the, your platform? Yes, publicly available, enhance. What's in, in enhance? It's uh, Google, the gold standard for the phenotypic and exposure from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey where today in the database, there's 41,000 patients with 1,200 measurements, which is available. And so you have a 10 minute video to show clinical examples. There's multiple research papers and you can, by clicking here with no login, no password, access this data to be able to test it. And the slides will be available. So you'll be able to, uh, to, to click directly on the link. Second one, where we integrate the data from the 1,000 genome project onto demo and GS, what we really wanted to do is to have phenotypic data and genomic data. And so that's another paper we published with Sean and Ricardo Bedati to be able to have different ways of looking at how to integrate genomic data within I2B2 and to see yeah, I2B2 framework to see how we can create scalable environment. A third project, GRDR, led by the uh, um, uh, NCATS uh, to, uh, from the National Center for Advanced Transitional Science, 
to where we integrated 10 rare disease registries, and we are now in the final stage of integrating the two last ones, to have a one central place, and you can have access to this data. This is open data to be able to access all those different disease, disease data with all those different patients, all those variables, that, and we mapped all this data to more than 20 uh, international ontologies using the UMLS, and so all this is accessible from the UI. I also wanted to show you the Philin McDermott syndrome project, but I've presented it many times, and so in the sake of time, where for the only thing is for this project, we integrated deep phenotyping from clinical notes, and to be able from the user interface to be able to review the output of natural language processing from the output of CTEX or any a natural language processing tool, we wanted to have one way to validate and see the raw sentences where it comes from. We wanted to have a way, so to have an extra button here in the I2B2 Transmart framework, where for Billy's calculus, to be able to see the sentences and to then be able to validate and say yes or no. And there's a poster up there showing this example to be able to uh, trust all the data coming from the natural language processing. Could we have done this with uh, Transmart by itself? No. That's why we needed the I2B2 software to use the software underlying logic to be able to do all those functionality. And then we added additional components, but the core base is really the I2B2 software. And then, now to finish, where what I've showed you, what you can see from those different um, uh, la, la, version that we developed internally, where today it's only my team who committed code to this, is using the latest version of I2B2, the version 1.0 the version 1 hotfix that is now five years old from Transmart, and we did all the internal development, all our internal patch and uh, maintaining it so that we could use it on production in all those different uh, projects. But then this version doesn't, is completely different from what you can see and the functionalities you can have within the Transmart community. So then there's a big issue because we need to make the, those coming together. Because the version we have, the DBMI, of a DBMI I2B2 Transmart is this combination of the latest version of I2B2, the database and the software. And the software, that's the key point. The old version of Transmart and all the different improvements we did. But then this is not scalable for the long term. So I've been begging the Transmart Foundation for the past two years to have funding to be able to do this. And now he's going to announce the funding. No, I'm kidding. I didn't get the funding. So the key point, the funding, yeah. So he started to get scared. So the uh, we didn't get the funding because what we really wanted to do, and when people was asking me, can I install your version? I said, yeah, but we don't have the latest version of Transmart. We first wanted to wait to have this funding of two developers to help us one year to bring the latest version of Transmart, the latest version of I2B2, and within the latest version of both of them. So to have, to stop having our own branch, the key point, to not using the source code we created, so what we created, and so that's where my team, so I decided this with my team this morning at 8 a.m. To and so I checked with Jason and uh, and Wenjie, and because what we were doing is we had our own version and we were waiting for this funding that was never arriving. And so the thing is, in order to create something fully scalable and fully open source, so that other people can help us to do it, because it's a chicken and egg between well for people to be able to use our version, I was waiting to have the funding, but then uh, this wasn't coming and all that, because getting NIH funding just to do infrastructure work to 
upgrade a version is something very difficult. And so that's why uh, what we decided is following, because yes, the PMC was announced and all that, of having a project um, manager community environment. But the thing is, we were not ready yet for the I2B2 Transmart one. I'm not talking about the I2B2 one. I'm not talking about the Transmart one. I'm talking about the I2B2 Transmart PMC. We were not ready to open all our source code to everyone to help us and receive contribution from others. But then that's where realizing long discussion yesterday with the other uh, Transmart leaders and with the I2B2 leaders in, in realizing that in order to make this happen, we are interested in trying to have, and so using the Dockerized version we have, so that's the key point. We want to do this from on Docker from the beginning, to have everything on Docker so that the installation would be much easier from I2B2, from Transmart, from all the different components of Transmart. And so we started this Dockerization, we started this. And so the, the, the project here is to have something fully open source, meaning accepting, so to re have other commits, other review, other people looking at our code, other people helping us doing this, truly open, and not as we were doing, as saying, well, trying to put things together. Um, and then so, and not to create a first version of an I2, a true I2B2 Transmart from the I2B2 Transmart Foundation, where we will integrate all our enhancement that we've been doing, that my team has been doing for the past, because they didn't want to take my code. All my code was taken away, everything. <laughs> so to take the code for the past three years of all our enhancement, and then integrate this with the latest version of I2B2, and the latest version of Transmart. So then a sticky point is which last, latest version of Transmart? And so the latest official release is the 16.2. Ward presented you the 17.1. The thing is, we haven't decided yet what would be the best version. Why? And in the complete of full transparency, as I've been trying to do. Now, so I wasn't going to present this, uh, so I completely changed my slide this morning. So the thing is, uh, when for the 17.1, when they mentioned that they reintegrated I2B2, well, no, they reintegrated some functionalities, but the thing is, they didn't reintegrate the I2B2 software. They are not taking the source code that Sean's team have been doing for the past 15 years. And so it's a, a question of reinventing the wheel, of you trying to copy some of the functionalities of I2B2 software into a new software, the 17.1. So saying that in 17.1, there's already a full reintegration of I2B2, that's not my point of view. That's not the that may be the point of view of other people, it's an open source community, but that's not the point of view I share. So we haven't decided yet, we haven't looked, and so that way we would need your help in order to make this happen. And what we're going to do is to open our Docker, and so that's where the other part of my team didn't know that, so that's why they were saying, oh, to, we are going to, uh, open the Docker version of our I2B2 Transmart, which today works with enhanced data. So there's 41,000 patients. It works today. So because we started to do this very slowly, we were waiting for the funding that never arrived. But then now we need your help for those who are interested to help us to bring this. So is this using the version we have today running with Docker is not the 16.2, is the 1.6.4? Anyway, the version of Transmart in Docker, 1.6.4? The one, the, the version pre previously. 
1.2.4, yes. So today, we have a working version of I2B2 latest version in Docker with Transmon 1.2.4 running in Docker with 41,000 patients in it. It works, and that's what the opening point of where we need your help so that you install it, you play with it. It's using the enhanced data set. And, to, and what we want to do is to move from the 1.2.4 version that way it's working on Docker, where we use all the deployment and all the security related to this, and to move with the latest version of Transmart. Will it be the 16.2 or 17.1? We don't know yet. That's what the PMC will decide. We don't know yet. And then to integrate all the internal deployments, development that we did into this so that there's no more an internal version. There's only one public version of open source, truly open source, of I2B2 Transmart. And so that's my last slide. And so what we want to do for, and I didn't have this because there was, yes, and there, there was a huge agreement last night with uh, the I2B2 Transmart uh, Foundation in order to, should we do this? And so I say, I'm not ready. My version is not stable enough. It's not ready. But then that's where um, Keith gave me the book, asked me to, the book he presented, say, read this. So, yeah, I don't have time to read this within the night. <laughs> I had to create all my slides. <laughs> and then to, uh, so the thing is, we really want to make this for real to start. Where, and so if you're interested to join, please send an email to Diane and myself where we we don't know we don't know how this will work we don't know how uh, how we are going to scale up but the key point is everything that all the infrastructure all the deployment that we created we want this truly open source all the across cloud everything all the security all the HIPAA compliance we want everything to be fully uh, uh, fully deployed and so that's where we need to go into another regime of openness so the um, because i was hoping again 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 of getting the, this funding but uh, the farmer uh, from the transplant foundation didn't like it fine uh, let's uh, do it ourselves so the, the key point that's where so you can use those are the open source project that we have where you can play with the data. And so everything I've presented so far uh, wouldn't have been able with this outstanding team uh, that uh, made it ever possible. So thank you. That's what I wanted to show you.